Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Plague by Albert Camus. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to go through and read the blurb. Then I'll go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. One thing I want to say uh, to begin with is I was kind of surprised I hadn't already read this because I've been coming, I've been becoming kind of an Albert Camus fan this year, and obviously it's the perfect time to read this. In fact, I actually specifically got this now because with some optimism around vaccines and that kind of stuff, the hope is that this won't be as relevant this time next year. Uh, although it is about the bubonic plague, and so I was kind of expecting it to have. I don't know, more relatable stuff for our like current pandemic in it, but uh, it is still a cracking read and um, what I think I like about it as well, I've been enjoying recently novels that have more kind of philosophy behind them and actually Camus, I know him as a philosopher, in fact I put off reading his novels for a long time because I thought I wouldn't understand them because they'd be too philosophical, whereas it turns out they're just right, they're just my cup of tea. So yeah, let's read the blurb. On the morning of April 16th, Dr. Ryu and more on the morning of April 16th, Dr. Rue emerged from his consulting room and came across a dead rat in the middle of the landing. It starts with rats. Vomiting blood, they die in their hundreds, then in their thousands. When the rats are all gone, the citizens begin to fall sick. Like the rats, they too die in ever greater numbers. The authorities quarantine the town. Cut off, the terrified townspeople must face this horror alone. Some resign themselves to death or the whims of fate. Others seek someone to blame or dream of revenge. One is determined to escape. But a few, like stoic Dr. Rue, stand together to fight the terror. A monstrous evil has entered their lives, but they will never surrender. They will resist the plague. Right, let's check some of these tabs. So this is translated from the French by Stuart Gilbert. I did read it in English. I, I would consider reading it in French. I, I definitely would lose a lot of the meaning though, so I'm glad I did read it in English. We get this with Rue. Someone says, Thanks doctor for remembering me, but this time it's somebody else. The man next door has had an accident. Please come at once, it's urgent. He sounded out of breath. Rue thought quickly, yes, he could see the porter afterwards. A few minutes later, he was entering a small house in the Rue Federme, on the outskirts of the town. Halfway up the drafty, foul-smelling stairs, he saw Joseph Grand, the municipal clerk, hurrying down to meet him. He was a man of about 50 years of age, tall and drooping, with narrow shoulders, thin limbs, and a yellowish moustache. He looks better now, he told Rue, but I really thought his number was up. He blew his nose vigorously. On the top floor, the second, Rue noticed something scrawled in red chalk on a door on the left. Come in, I've hanged myself. They entered the room. A rope dangled from a hanging lamp above a chair lying on its side. The dining room table had been pushed into a corner, but the rope hung empty. I love this bit as well, because obviously I'm learning a bit of French myself. So, uh, meanwhile, however, he informed the doctor that he really knew very little about Qatar, but believed him to have private means in a small way. Qatar was a rum bird. For a long while, their relations went no farther than wishing each other good day when they met on the stairs. I've only had two conversations with him. Some days ago, I upset a box of coloured chalks I was bringing home on the landing. There were red and blue chalks. Just then, Qatar came out of his room and he helped me to pick them up. He asked me what I wanted coloured chalks for. Grand had then explained to him that he was trying to brush up his Latin. He'd learnt it at school, of course, but his memory had grown blurred. You see, Doctor, I've been told that a knowledge of Latin gives one a better understanding of the real meanings of French words. So he wrote Latin words on his blackboard, then copied out again in blue chalk the part of each word that changed in conjugation or declension, and in red chalk the part of the word that never varied. I'm not sure if Qatar followed this very clearly, but he seemed interested and asked me for a red chalk. That rather surprised me, but after all, of course, I couldn't guess the use he'd put it to. So he's kind of the societal response to an attempt on suicide as well. It can't be rough with an invalid, a man who's hanged himself, can they, Doctor? Rue gazed down at him for a moment, then assured him that there was no question of anything like that, and in any case he was here to protect his patient, at which Qatar seemed relieved and Rue went out to fetch the inspector. After Grand's deposition had been read out, Qatar was asked to state the exact motive of his act. He merely replied, without looking at the police officer, that a secret grief described it well enough. The inspector then asked him peremptorily if he intended to have another go at it. Showing more animation, Qatar said certainly not, his one wish was to be left alone in peace. Allow me to point out, my man, the police officer rejoined with asperity, that just now it's you who's troubling the peace of others. Rue signed to him not to continue and he left it at that. And uh, I'm going to read this opening up here uh, because I think this does kind of relate quite nicely back to our society. The word plague had just been uttered for the first time. At this stage of the narrative, with Dr. Bernard Rue standing at his window, the narrator may perhaps be allowed to justify the doctor's uncertainty and surprise, since, with very slight differences, his reaction was the same as that of the great majority of our townsfolk. Everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, yet somehow we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from a blue sky. There have been as many plagues as wars in history, yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. 
In fact, like all our fellow citizens, Ru was caught off his guard, and we should understand his hesitations in the light of this fact, and similarly understand how he was torn between conflicting fears and confidence. When a war breaks out, people say it's too stupid, it can't last long. But though a war may well be too stupid, that doesn't prevent it lasting. Stupidity has a knack of getting its way, as we should see if we were not always so much wrapped up in ourselves. In this respect, our townsfolk were like everybody else, wrapped up in themselves. In other words, they were humanists, they disbelieved in pestilences. A pestilence isn't a thing made to man's measure. Therefore, we tell ourselves that pestilence is a mere bogey of the mind, a bad dream that will pass away. But it doesn't always pass away, and from one bad dream to another, it is men who pass away, and the humanists first of all, because they haven't taken their precautions. Our townsfolk were not more to blame than others, they forgot to be modest, that was all, and thought that everything still was possible for them, which presupposed that pestilences were impossible. They went on doing business, arranged for journeys and formed views. How should they have given a thought to anything like plague, which rules out any future, cancels journeys, silences the exchange of views? They fancied themselves free, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. Susie wanted me to read this bit out, because this, this page ends here. Uh, when, they were, when they were at the laboratory gate, Qatar told the doctor that he would greatly like to see him and ask his advice about something. Rue, who was fingering in his pocket, oh, the sheet of paper with the figures on it, said he'd better call during his consulting hours. Thought we were about to go into erotica there, Jesus. We get a use of facetious, uh, which I love because I make a lot of facetious comments. So, uh, Rue said nothing. About this time, the weather appeared set fair and the sun had drawn up the last puddles left by the recent rain. There was a serene blue sky flooded with golden light each morning, with sometimes a drone of planes in the rising heat. All seemed well with the world. And yet within four days, the fever had made four startling strides. 16 deaths, 24, 28 and 32. On the fourth day, the opening of the auxiliary hospital in the premises of an infant school was officially announced. The local population, who so far had made a point of masking their anxiety by facetious comments, now seemed tongue-tied and went their ways with gloomy faces. And here we have part two. Um, I want to read this paragraph. One of the most striking consequences of the closing of the gates was, in fact, this sudden deprivation befalling people who were completely unprepared for it. Mothers and children, lovers, husbands and wives, who had a few days previously taken it for granted that their parting would be a short one, who had kissed each other goodbye on the platform and exchanged a few trivial remarks, sure as they were of seeing each other again after a few days, or at most a few weeks, duped by our blind human faith in the near future, and little if at all diverted from their normal interests by this leave-taking. All these people found themselves, without the least warning, hopelessly cut off, prevented from seeing each other again, or even communicating with each other. For actually, the closing of the gates took place some hours before the official order was made known to the public, and, naturally enough, it was impossible to take individual cases of hardship into account. It might be said that the first effect of this brutal visitation was to compel our townsfolk to act as if they had no feelings as individuals. During the first part of the day on which the prohibition to leave the town came into force, the prefect's office was besieged by a crowd of applicants, advancing pleas of equal cogency but equally impossible to take into consideration. Indeed, it needed several days for us to realise that we were completely cornered, that words like special arrangements, favour and priority had lost all effective meaning. And uh, I think this is something that we can probably relate to in our modern era, you know. It is noteworthy that our townspeople very quickly desisted, even in public, from a habit one might have expected them to form, that of trying to figure out the probable duration of their exile. The reason was this. When the most pessimistic had fixed it at, say, six months, when they had drunk in advance the dregs of bitterness of those six black months, and painfully screwed up their courage to the sticking place, straining all their remaining energy to endure valiantly the long ordeal of all those weeks and days, when they had done this, some friend they met, an article in a newspaper, a vague suspicion, or a flash of foresight would suggest that, after all, there was no reason why the epidemic shouldn't last more than six months. Why not a year or even more? At such moments, the collapse of their courage, willpower and endurance was so abrupt that they felt they could never drag themselves out of the pit of despondent to which they had fallen. Therefore, they forced themselves never to think about the problematic day of escape, to cease looking to the future, and always to keep, so to speak, their eyes fixed on the ground at their feet. But, naturally enough, this prudence, this habit of fainting with their predicament and refusing to put up a fight were ill rewarded. For, while averting that revulsion which they found so unbearable, they also deprived themselves of those redeeming moments, frequent enough when all is told, when by conjuring up pictures of a reunion to be they could forget about the plague. Thus, in a middle course between these heights and depths, they drifted through life rather than lived, the prey of aimless days and sterile memories, like wandering shadows that could have acquired substance only by consenting to root themselves in the solid earth of their distress. Bootiful. Nicely put, Mr. Camus. And uh, another little passage here I enjoyed. 
For in the heat and stillness, and for the troubled hearts of her townsfolk, anything, even the least sound, had a heightened significance. The varying aspects of the sky, the very smells rising from the soil that mark each change of season, were taken notice of for the first time. Everyone realised with dismay that hot weather would favour the epidemic, and it was clear that summer was setting in. The cries of swifts in the evening air above the housetop were growing shriller, and the sky too had lost the spaciousness of those June twilights when our horizons seemed infinitely remote. In the markets the flowers no longer came in buds, they were already in full bloom and, after the morning's marketing, the dusty pavements were littered with trampled petals. It was plain to see that spring had spent itself, lavished its ardour on the myriads of flowers that were bursting everywhere into bloom, and now was being crushed out by the twofold onslaught of heat and plague. For our fellow citizens, that summer sky and the streets thick in dust, grey as their present lives, had the same ominous import as the hundred deaths now weighing daily on the town. That incessant sunlight and those bright hours associated with siesta or with holidays no longer invited, as in the past, to frolics and flirtation on the beaches. Now they rang hollow in the silence of the closed town. They had lost the golden spell of happier summers. Plague had killed all colours, vetoed pleasure. That indeed was one of the great changes brought by the epidemic. Hitherto, all of us welcomed summer in with pleasant anticipation. The town was open to the sea and its young folk made free of the beaches. But this summer, for all its nearness, the sea was out of bounds. Young limbs had no longer the run of its delights. What could we do under these conditions? It is Taru once again who paints the most faithful picture of our life in those days. Needless to say, he outlines the progress of the plague and he too notes that a new phase of the epidemic was ushered in when the wireless announced no longer weekly totals, but 92, 107 and 130 deaths in a day. The newspapers and the authorities are playing ball with the plague. They fancy they're scoring off it because 130 is a smaller figure than 910. He also records such striking or moving incidents of the epidemic as came under his notice. That, for instance, of the woman in a lonely street who abruptly opened a shuttered window just above his head and gave two loud shrieks before closing the shutters again on the dark interior of a third floor bedroom. But he also noted that the peppermint lozenges had vanished from the chemist shops because there was a popular belief that when sucking them you were proof against contagion. We get so just this is just one of those funny things about lang language. I enjoyed this. Uh, I'm just going to read this out. On the tables, including that at which Rambo was sitting, bird droppings were drying, and he was puzzled whence they came until, after some wing flappings, a handsome cock came hopping out of his retreat in a dark corner. Just then the heat seemed to rise several daggers more. Qatar took off his coat and banged on the tabletop. A very small man wearing a long blue apron that came nearly to his neck emerged from a doorway at the back, shouted a greeting to Qatar and, vigorously kicking the cock out of his way, came up to the table. God, it's making me wince. I like this little exchange. Why does he want to go? His wife is in France. Ah. After a short pause he added, what's his job? He's a journalist. Is he now? Journalists have long tongues very true and as someone who is turning 32 this summer I relate to this line at 30 one's beginning to age and one's got to squeeze all one can out of life but I doubt if you can understand and uh, you may have noticed in the background of this this uh, video we have St. James Infirmary banging tune uh, and that is essentially because of this you've no objection to a spot of something strong no Taru replied quite the contrary Rue sniffed the pungency of bitter herbs in the drink that Rambert handed him. It was hard to make oneself heard in the din of voices, but Rambert seemed chiefly concerned with drinking. The doctor couldn't make up his mind whether he was drunk yet. At one of the two tables which occupied all the remaining space beyond the half circle round the bar, a naval officer, with a girl on each side of him, was describing to a fat red-faced man a typhus epidemic at Cairo. They had camps, you know, he was saying, for the natives, with tents for the sick ones and a ring of sentries all round. If a, memory, if a member of the family came along and tried to smuggle in one of those damn full native remedies, they fired at sight. A bit tough, I grant you, but it was the only thing to do. At the other table, round which sat a bevy of bright young people, the talk was incomprehensible, half drowned by the stridents of St. James's Infirmary coming from a loudspeaker just above their heads. And then we get another reference to St. James Infirmary. And we learn that Ryu's wife is in a sanatorium, uh, which is like a old-timey mental hospital, I guess. So I want to read out here at the start of part three. This is quite a long section, so bear with me. Thus, week by week, the prisoners of plague put up what fight they could. Some, like Rambert, even contrived to fancy they were still behaving as free men and had the power of choice. But actually, it would have been truer to say that by this time, mid-August, the plague had swallowed up everything and everyone. 
No longer were there individual destinies, only a collective destiny made of plague and the emotions shared by all. Strongest of these emotions was the sense of exile and of deprivation, with all the cross currents of revolt and fear set up by these. That is why the narrator thinks this moment, registering the climax of the summer heat and the disease, the best for describing on general lines and by way of illustration, the excesses of the living, burials of the dead and the plight of parted lovers. It was at this time that a high wind rose and blew for several days through the plague-stricken city. Wind is particularly dreaded by the inhabitants of Oran, since the plateau on which the town is built presents no natural obstacle, and it can sweep our streets with unimpeded violence. During the months when not a drop of rain had refreshed the town, a grey crust had formed on everything, and this flaked off under the wind, dis disintegrating into dust clouds. What with the dust and scraps of paper walled against people's legs, the streets grew emptier. Those few who went out could be seen hurrying along, bent forward with handkerchiefs or their hands pressed to their mouths. At nightfall, instead of the usual throng of people, each trying to prolong a day which might well be his last, he met only small groups hastening home or to a favourite cafe. With the result that for several days, when twilight came, it fell much quicker at this time of the year, the streets were almost empty and silent but for the long drawn stridents of the wind. A smell of brine and seaweed came from the unseen storm-tossed sea, and in the growing darkness the almost empty town, pulled in dust, swept by bitter sea spray, and loud with the shrilling of the wind, seemed a lost island of the damned. Hitherto the plague had found far more victims in the more thickly populated and less well-appointed outer districts than in the heart of the town. Quite suddenly, however, it launched a new attack and established itself in the business centre. Residents accused the wind of carrying infection, broadcasting germs as the hotel manager put it. Whatever the reason might be, people living in the central districts realised that their turn had come when each night they heard oftener and oftener the ambulances clanging past, sounding the plague's dismal, passionless toxin under the windows. The authorities had the idea of segregating certain particularly affected central areas and permitting only those whose services were indispensable to cross the cordon. Dwellers in these areas could not help regarding these regulations as a sort of taboo specially directed at themselves, and thus they came, by contrast, to envy residents in other districts their freedom and the latter, to cheer themselves up in despondent moments, fell to picturing the lot of those others less free than themselves. Anyhow, they're some worse off than I, was a remark that voiced the only solace to be had in those days. And then, basically, like, mass burials are happening, and so we get this. For then, coffins became scarcer. Also, there was a shortage of winding sheets and of space in the cemetery. Something had to be done about this, and one obvious step, justified by its practical convenience, was to combine funerals and, when necessary, multiply the trips between the hospital and the burial place. At one moment, the stock of coffins in Rue's hospital was reduced to five. Once filled, all five were loaded together in the ambulance. At the cemetery, they were emptied out and the iron grey corpses put on stretchers and deposited in a shed reserved for that purpose, to wait their turn. Meanwhile, the empty coffins, after being sprayed with antiseptic fluid, were rushed back to the hospital and the process was repeated as often as necessary. This system worked excellently. This system worked excellently and won the approval of the prefect. He even told Rue that it was really a great improvement on the death carts driven by Negroes, of which one reads in accounts of former visitations of this sort. Yes, Rousse. And though the burials are much the same, we keep careful records of them. That, you will agree, is progress. Successful, however, as the system proved itself in practice, there was something so distasteful in the last rites as now performed that the prefect felt constrained to forbid relations of the deceased being present at the actual interment. They were allowed to come only as far as the cemetery gates, and even that was not authorised officially. In a patch of open ground dotted with lentisk trees at the far end of the cemetery, two big pits had been dug. One was reserved for the men, the other for the women. Thus, in this respect, the authorities still gave thought to propriety, and it was only later that by the force of things this last remnant of decorum went by the board, and men and women were flung into the death pits indiscriminately. Happily, this ultimate indignity synchronised with the plague's last ravages. Brutal. And I thought this was amusing, because, uh, I mean, I guess this is kind of how I think with my anxiety as well. Getting worse every day, isn't it? Well, anyhow, everyone's in the same boat. Obviously, Taru comments, he's in the same peril of death as everyone else, but that's just the point. He's in it with the others. And then I'm pretty sure he doesn't seriously think he runs much personal risk. He has got the idea into his head, apparently, and perhaps it's not so far-fetched as it seems, that a man suffering from a dangerous ailment or grave anxiety is immune from other ailments and anxieties. Have you noticed, he asked me, that no one ever runs two diseases at once? Let's suppose you have an incurable disease like cancer or a galloping consumption. Well, you'll never get plague or typhus. It's a physical impossibility. In fact, one might go farther. Have you ever heard of a man with cancer being killed in a motor smash? 
This theory, for what it's worth, keeps Qatar cheerful. The thing he'd most detest is being cut off from others. He'd rather be one of a beleaguered crowd than a prisoner alone. The plague has put an effective stop to police inquiries, sleuthings, warrants of arrest and so forth. Come to that, we have no police nowadays. No crimes, past or present, no more criminals. Only condemned men hoping for the most capricious of pardons. And amongst these are the police themselves. So we get this where like Rue's motivation is, is sort of questioned because he wants to escape to go and reunite with his wife. On one of the few occasions when she spoke, it was to ask him if he wasn't afraid of infecting his wife with plague. He replied that there might be some risk of that, but only a very slight one, while if he stayed in the town, there was a fair chance of their never seeing each other again. The old woman smiled. Is she nice? Very nice. Pretty? I think so. Ah, she nodded. That explains it. I mean, she is in a sanatorium as well, but you know. Great line here, which I appreciate. At my age, one's got to be sincere. Lying's too much effort. And another great little bit of dialogue here. So uh, Rue straightened up slowly, he gazed at Panelu, summoning to his gaze all the strength and fervour he could muster against his weariness. He heard a voice behind him. Why was there that anger in your voice just now? What we'd been seeing was so unbearable to me as it was to you. Rue turned towards Panelu. I know, I'm sorry, but weariness is a kind of madness, and there are times when the feeling I have is one of mad revolt. I understand, Panelu said in a low voice. That sort of thing is revolting because it passes our human understanding. But perhaps we should love what we cannot understand. Uh, I thought this was quite quite fascinating too. So, All Souls Day that year was very different from what it had been in former years. True, the weather was seasonable. There had been a sudden change and the great heat had given place to mild autumnal air. As in other years, a cool wind blew all day and big clouds raced from one horizon to the other, trailing shadows over the houses upon which fell again when they had passed the pale gold light of a November sky. The first waterproofs made their appearance. Indeed, one was struck by the number of glossy, rubberized garments. The reason was that our newspapers had informed us that 200 years previously, during the great pestilences of southern Europe, the doctors wore oiled clothing as a safeguard against infection. The shops had seized this opportunity of unloading their stock of out-of-fashion waterproofs, which their purchasers fondly hoped would guarantee immunity from germs. But these familiar aspects of All Souls Day could not make us forget that the cemeteries were left unvisited. In previous years, the rather sickly smell of chrysanthemums had filled the trams, while long lines of women could be seen making pilgrimage to the places where members of the family were buried to lay flowers on the graves. This was the day when they made amends for the oblivion and dereliction in which their dead had slept for many a long month. But in their plague year, people no longer wished to be reminded of their dead, because indeed they were thinking all too much about them as it was. There was no more question of revisiting them with a shade of regret and much melancholy. They were no longer the forsaken to whom one day in the year you came to justify yourself. They were intruders whom you would rather forget. That's why the Day of the Dead this year was tacitly but willfully ignored. As Qatar dryly remarked, Taru noticed that the habit of irony was growing on him more and more. Each day was for us a day of the dead. And in fact, the bale fires of the pestilence were blazing ever more merrily in the crematorium. It is true that the actual number of deaths showed no increase, but it seemed the plague had settled in for good at its most virulent, and it took its daily toll of deaths with the punctual zeal of a good civil servant. Theoretically, and in the view of the authorities, this was a hopeful sign. The fact that the graft after its long rising curve had flattened out seemed to many, Dr. Richard for example, reassuring. The graph's good today, he would remark, rubbing his hands. To his mind, the disease had reached what he called high watermark. Thereafter, it could but ebb. He gave the credit of this to Dr. Castle's new serum, which, indeed, had brought off some quite unlooked for recoveries. While not dissenting, the old doctor reminded him that the future remained uncertain. History proved that epidemics have a way of recrudescing when least expected. The authorities, who had long been desirous of giving a fillip to the morale of the populace, but had so far been prevented by the plague from doing so, now proposed to convene a meeting of the medical corps and ask for an announcement on the subject. Unfortunately, just before the meeting was due to take place, Dr. Richard, too, was carried off by the plague, then precisely at high watermark. And I just thought this was interesting. This is the last bit I'm going to read out. Have you ever seen a man shot by a firing squad? No, of course not. The spectators are hand-picked and it's like a private party. You need an invitation. The result is that you've gleaned your ideas about it from books and pictures, a post, a blindfolded man, some soldiers in the offing. But the real thing isn't a bit like that. Do you know that the firing squad stands only a yard and a half from the condemned man? Do you know that if the victim took two steps forward, his chest would touch the rifles? Do you know that at this short range, the soldiers concentrate their fire on the region of the heart, and their big bullets make a hole into which you could thrust your fist? No, you didn't know all that. Those are things that are never spoken of. For the plague-stricken, their peace of mind is more important than a human life. Decent folks must be allowed to sleep easier nights, mustn't they? Really, it would be shockingly bad taste to linger on such deaths. That's common knowledge. But personally, I've never been able to sleep well since then. The bad taste remained in my mouth and I've kept lingering on the deaths, brooding over them. 
So yeah, all in all, very philosophical novel, uh, which is just what I like to read anyway, and uh, Camus is actually a really good novelist as well as a fascinating philosopher. So I gave this a pretty solid 4.5 out of 5, and I wouldn't be surprised if you see this on my favourites of the quarter, or even the, well, my favourites of the quarter always go into the favourites of the year, but you know what I mean. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Plague by Albert Camus. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.